Well, we got Gary Boomershine, and a lot of people probably already know who you are, Gary. I appreciate you being on the show, but for those who might not know who you are, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, Jack, great to be here. I'm super excited. Uh, I know we actually got this kind of pulled together kind of quickly for your group. And uh, so for everybody that doesn't know me, my name is Gary Boomershine. I am a, uh, I, I've, I've actually got the, I guess the term is called OG, <laughs> mm -hmm. original gangster in real estate. If you've been through multiple cycles, I guess that's the term. Rafael Vargas actually told me that. I thought that was funny. Who's a big wholesaler uh, on the, on, out, of, out of Florida. But I've been doing real estate a long, long time. I run a company uh, for what most people know me for realestateinvestor.com. Used to be a company called REI Vault. We're the largest marketer for real estate uh, for both agents and investors all over the country. I think we've mailed out, you and I were talking, I think as I was running the numbers, we're close to 55 million pieces of direct mail that we've mailed out for some of our clients. Uh, we got about 1,200 clients and we do a massive amount of phone, uh, we call them sales ninjas, but it's as the leads come in, being able to actually do the qualifying screening and appointment setting. And we've done mm -hmm. nearly three and a half million, almost 4 million seller calls appointments. And so uh, that's our, our primary business, but I've been real estate investing since 2004, live in San Francisco Bay area and, uh, and uh, been talking about the real estate cycles for a long, mm -hmm. long time. Real estate has been a seven year cycle and uh, we've this uh, for a hundred years. And this is the longest cycle. And I've been talking about the, the cycle change of what's coming for probably three years. And now obviously we're in the middle of COVID and here we are. And just for all the, all, all your loyal listeners, these are some of the biggest transitions in wealth ever. This is really the type of market that we're going into now that many of us investors have been looking for. And uh, so buckle up your seatbelts. We're getting ready for an incredible, incredible opportunity for being in this particular real estate market right now and for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And in fact, I almost want to predict myself that we're just, as investors, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg at this point. I mean, we're, we're still seeing a lot of people who are getting deferred loans and, and their unemployment might be starting to dry up and, and, what have you here soon. So it, we're just possibly just starting to see that type of distressed seller, if you will, in, in these markets. Yeah. I, 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 I run a podcast. I was actually just sharing this uh, with our group uh, last week, you know, a tsunami is coming. Yeah. And what, what happens, it's almost like if you think of a huge tsunami, right. Coming, people go out to the beach and the water is going out and there's fish, you know, all over the beach sand. And a lot of people like look down saying, Oh, look at all the pretty fish on the sand. No, a tsunami is coming and it's typically a, a, a period of time. So we're going to be seeing a massive number of foreclosures. We're going to see, I've been my prediction, and this is all based on market history is we're going to probably see an, an initial drop across the board for most markets. We're gonna probably see a decrease in value uh, for a period of time and then probably massive, massive appreciation mm -hmm. in values. Why? Because they're printing money uh, in unprecedented amounts. The Federal Reserve, our fiat money system, we've never printed money. And so that becomes an, a hyperinflationary period. What that means is, you know, regular stuff that we're buying, like, milk and eggs start to go up but the physical assets is really really where we want to be and um so we've been preparing i think what we've been telling everybody this is the three p's right now it's number one is protect number two is pivot and number three is profit and um and i think that there's an incredible opportunity a lot of us are doing what's called virtual wholesaling jack um that's the market as i see it uh especially on the single family side um, and there are still plenty of buyers. The market's super hot for that. Virtual wholesaling, a lot of people know what that is, but virtual just means we're able to do it remotely. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of us have adjusted our businesses and those that are just. Here to two years is going to be the buying opportunity. 
And so preparing right now for that opportunity that's going to come for most of us. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's go back to some of the things you've just said there. You know, the virtual wholesaling is, is something that's always been uh, something that we've dabbled in, but haven't really dived into. Um, can, can you talk a little bit like how, how are some people uh, doing this virtual wholesaling? You know, it's, especially for newer investors, wholesaling seems to be the low hanging fruit, you know, the concept of getting a property under contract and just selling paper. Um, and until they do it that first time, it seems like that's when the gate gateway drug happens is when they finally get it like, Oh, now it becomes possible and it becomes, you can possibly do it on a consistent basis. How do you do that with a virtual wholesale? Yeah. Um, it's actually a lot easier than might people might think. Um, uh, the main difference, so most wholesaling, we're in a local market. We're working in, in our small market, typically 250,000 you know, properties uh, in a local market, and we're able to go and meet the seller face-to-face. -face. The difference virtually is we're most, most often, we're not actually even meeting the seller or the buyer face-to-face. -face. We're doing it remotely. Um, and in some places, some people are doing it from across other states. I've got a, we've got a realestateinvestor.com member. Uh, these guys have got a six figure wholesaling business. They do it out of Vancouver. They live in Canada and they're working Austin and a couple of markets, uh, in Texas completely remotely. Um, mm -hmm. they, uh, they found that it was actually even easier for them to do it remotely. They, for about six months, they moved locally and then they went back and said, wow, we're making more money doing this remote. Um, it's over the phone. And especially with what's going on with COVID, uh, a lot of sellers, um, all of us have adjusted to being able to use, you know, Zoom as an example. So a lot of the Zoom meetings are for um, recording of the properties and property tours. A lot of the buyers, now the cash buyers that were selling the houses too, they're typically local. So they'll go and typically see the house. It might be virtual, but everything, the closings, the whole thing is uh, remote. And mm -hmm. the hardest part of that whole business is probably mindset of just the, the fact that you can do it. Mm -hmm. And then number two is, you know, it takes some, uh, the, the interaction with the seller over the phone, it typically is a little bit more more numbers of interactions. Like you can go meet with the seller face to face. We're closing the deal at the dining room table a lot faster than we might, um, that we might if we're, if we're doing it over the phone. That's what I found. I've been doing the virtual wholesaling kind of model and in, 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 that's not my primary business, but I've been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. And the guy, the guy that actually coined it, his name is Chris Chico. You probably uh, have heard of Chris. Good, super good friend of mine but he was what's called kind of the grandfather of virtual wholesaling. He's in Miami and he was buying properties, all over, wholesaling properties all over the country. So I like just to stand back, you know, um, wholesaling is almost like being a general contractor of a, of a property with only a hammer. It's just mm -hmm. one strategy. And so I like to look at real estate as three buckets, cash now, cash flow, cash later. And virtual wholesaling or wholesaling is typically just cash now. It is really truly a job. It's a, trans, a single transaction where I'm putting a property under contract with a seller. So I got a signed contract. I find a buyer that's willing to pay a higher price and then mm -hmm. I'm getting a, an assignment fee. Um, so it is, you know, it's great in this market because there's very little risk. It's more time and a little bit of marketing uh, money because we're, mm -hmm. we're having to find those deals. Um, cash flow are typically rental properties. And I know that you're a huge fan of the rentals as I am. Um, and, and doing things like notes, private lending, and then cash later is the long-term holds, right. Of being able to take appreciation and depreciation. And the reason I like virtual wholesaling right now is that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. There's money to be made. A lot of us are actually doing wholesaling um, just because we don't know exactly where we anticipate we're going to see a drop in prices. At least my group and myself 
that we're going to see a small drop in lots of the areas of the country before we see a big increase. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just being very, being watchful on what we're buying right now, if the fundamentals work, right, and you can afford a second wave of this COVID thing, then by all means, that would be a great thing to go buy. But a lot, you know, we're coming out of the euphoric stage of real estate, the tail end of the peak of a market. And right. as we know, you know, Warren Buffett says, buy low, sell high, right? Don't mm -hmm. lose investor money and uh, follow the laws. And so I'm not a big fan right now of just going out and buying, you know, the fix and flip and the rehabbing and the rental properties unless the fundamentals are there. Sure. So, you know, when you're talking about virtual wholesaling or, or anybody for that matter, you already mentioned marketing. But I'm going to kind of go about this a little backwards because a lot of people target marketing and try to find those, those potential sellers. But I think it's probably, in my opinion, anyway, in experience, you got to establish that buyer's list first. And you got to find those potential buyers. What have you seen in marketing that, uh, that's been fruitful in establishing those, those buyers in those virtual markets? Yeah, great question. Um, we've done a lot of buyer marketing, and I'll just tell you, for the most part, we're not, doing, not having to do a lot of buyer marketing. A lot of people have had this philosophy of having this huge buyer's list. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have found is, is typically, especially for wholesalers, okay? So you've got different types of buyers. You've got the cash buyers, you've got the retail buyers, you've got the tenant buyers. So a lot of us who are putting either renters or maybe a tenant buyer who's buying uh, uh, with some sort of owner finance or lease option, they're, they're all different channels that we're going to go right. after. So for cash buyers, this is this is, we've been servicing like most of our clients uh, for realestateinvestor.com. I'd say 80% have been in this last 36 months, been very he heavily wholesaling. So they're looking for cash buyers. These are investor buyers that are either uh, fix and flip or full rehab, or they're buying for, you know, their rental pool mm -hmm. and they want long-term cash flow holds. And what we have found is that the, the abs there's two best ways that we've seen that have worked for us and our clients and, and, and all the masterminds that I'm in with my peers. One is going out on Facebook and LinkedIn and finding the, because they're very active. They're out mm. there um, in the local market. You can, you can pretty much type in, you know, your particular, your Salt Lake City uh, real estate investor and you'll find out pretty quickly, are these a rehabber and what their portfolio is because they're posting it. Or another avenue has been going out to the realtor list and uh, pulling properties, about 50, a little over 50% of all properties in America, the, the transactions across the country and single family have been investor purchases. Um, with a large percentage of those listed on the MLS. So going out to those agents and interacting to say, hey, I noticed that you, Mr. Agent, um, we're working with an investor. Is that investor looking for any more properties? Mm -hmm. I, I have a portfolio of properties and uh, I'm not sure if your, your buyer is actually looking for more. And we've been finding fantastic uh, cash buyers going through the realtor pool. By the way, those realtors, those, those cash buyers are typically paying a premium because they've been buying on the MLS, right? Uh, the multiple listing service on listed properties. And so that's been a great source for, for us from sure. what I've seen. Now, pulling a cash buyers list, you know, you can actually hear there's a cash buyers list and you can text message them, you know, broadcast by sending a text message. You can actually do ringless voicemail. You can send direct mail postcards. We do all of that for our clients, but very few people use it because it's not the, it's not really the most effective way uh, that we've seen, uh, sure. to go out. You know, and, sure. and if you're a wholesaler, you don't have to have hundreds of buyers. Like in my market, I'm in four markets, but like I'm here in the San Francisco Bay area and I primarily have four <laughs> investor buyers that I'm flipping properties to mm -hmm. that, you know, and I'm not a huge volume guy, but 
um, you don't really need a huge number of, of buyers. Now, if you're looking for tenant buyers, that's that's a totally different place where finding tenant buyers are usually, um, there's, there's mailing lists that you can typically find. Mailing would be a great way uh, or, or text message broadcast for mm. tenant buyers. Ten, the, ten, the best tenant buyers are people that are self-employed because they can't qualify for standard right. mortgages, right? Uh, or people that have less than stellar credit. Mm. That's been a great source for tenant buyers for, for a long time. Right. So on yeah. the flip side then, uh, let's talk about the marketing to those, those potential sellers and what, what is currently working today? You know, it, it seems like uh, certain marketing uh, kind of ebbs and flows depending on, the, on, on people's response. You know, for a while there, we actually saw our, the response like drop through the floor for our direct mail, but then it kind of yeah. started to uptick a little bit again. In fact, I'm getting phone calls on paper marketing material now that I sent like a year ago. Um, yeah. Which is, you know, it's kind of, I, I just, I can't imagine people holding onto a postcard that long, but I guess they do. Yeah. I, I got a great story. I mean, we've done direct mail from direct mail is probably, I mean, in terms of scalability, um, consistency, and it's probably one of the most proven ways to do it. However, mm -hmm. most people do it wrong. That's you, There is a formula for how to make direct mail work. We were interviewing uh, Scott Oots, who's in California. California is one of the toughest markets for direct mail. Uh, he's got a high six figure or high seven figure business. Um, he's crushing it right now in this COVID market. And he has less than one half of a percent response rate on his direct mail, but it's still the one that produces. So direct mail is a, it's a people, <clears throat> the first thing that's important is uh, it's a cost per deal. Mm -hmm. So the, the factor is what is the cost? Uh, how much money do I have to put into direct mail or any kind of marketing to produce enough leads? They're going to turn it into enough good leads that turn into a deal and knowing that formula. Uh, Scott is an example, averages $70,000 per deal, and he's spending in California $4,200. Mm -hmm. um, in some markets, it might be fifteen to $1,700 in marketing to average a $15,000 profit. So it's, uh, you know, the, the, the cost in, a, in, in an area like California or Portland or uh, Phoenix, Arizona is going to be higher, but the, typically the profits per deal are, are, are higher as well. So direct mail, um, outbound text blasting, uh, broadcasting mm -hmm. is one. You do have to be very watchful uh, and, and, and aware of the FCC requirements mm -hmm. um, because there are laws around that. Ringless voicemail is another one that probably has, you know, the bigger issues for ringless voicemail is we're Pulling a, pulling a list, we're skip tracing it for phone numbers, mm -hmm. and then we're loading it into a system that will actually send out, it, by, it, it, it calls the phone number and it just leaves a voice message. And that, that, those, have, those have pretty much been the most consistent. If you're going direct to the seller, right. um, there is online marketing. So um, you know, the best type of online marketing that I've seen is usually retargeting ads once the seller, like trying to buy pay-per-click or do Facebook ads, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very competitive market as, as I know you're, you're aware. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. we love direct mail, actually direct mail, but <clears throat> there's a, there's a way to get direct mail work. I can explain it to your people. Most, the 97% do not come off of the initial phone call. Right. So 3% of the deals will actually come off of the initial call. Mm hmm 90% come after the sixth follow-up, right? Right. So follow-up meaning, hey, the lead came in and you're, you're continuing to follow up. Somebody's calling them. You're sending out a text message to them. You're sending out a, a, an email to them if you've got their email address. 90% come after and, and less than 10% of any investor or agent follow up more than twice. Right. So direct mail, to make direct mail work, people, people give up. Uh, way too early. <laughs> I call it three feet from gold. So the leads come in, 
off a of direct mail, they have to be, they have, they need to automate uh, an, uh, an automatic uh, follow up system that will add automatically follow up and they do need to be phone called. So you have to have a, what we call an ISA, uh, an, a, a, somebody that's on the phone dialing all day long to get the sellers back on the call, mm -hmm. right? Leads come in, they'll hang up. 30% of all inbound calls coming in off a of direct mail are hangups. They mm -hmm. never actually leave a message, right? Or they get a live voice and they hang up. Those right. are absolutely gold, but somebody has to call them back. And what I found, what we find is the, the people that do not have success, they're not following up and they're not calling the sellers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If that makes you know, sense. It, well, you know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, uh, I've been known and, and to my partner's chagrin because he hears me sometimes doing it is that I'll even call back the people who call me to tell me to screw off um, just to apologize for bothering them. And, you know, I didn't mean to cause an offense or something. And sometimes half of them will go, well, you know, they'll apologize back. And then all of a sudden they know somebody across the st street that might be willing to sell me their house. So I've even yeah. gotten leads from that. So <laughs> yeah, Jack. And so everybody that's hearing this, if if you if you have been struggling with direct direct mail, this is an absolute gold mine right here. Some of the best leads, some of the absolute best leads are the angry sellers. The yep. people that are nice that say, I'm not interested in selling, uh, those are good too, but you want to wait for four months. So mm -hmm. you're the the, the 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 it's a not interested. The, the angry sellers, they're not angry at us for sending them a postcard. They're angry at something that's going on. Many times mm -hmm. they're fighting over money in the family. Maybe it's an inherited property or a rental property. Maybe mm -hmm. there's illness. Maybe there's divorce going on or money problems, especially right now. I, uh, I, I tell the story all the time. One of the biggest deals that I did uh, in single family, a, a seller... Uh, he was a fireman in, here in Southern California, left me the most, I mean, the most atrocious voicemail I've ever had. I mean, it threatened me. Mm -hmm. And and so if anybody that, that wants to try it, just write what I'm going to tell you. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I said to him. I called him back and he goes, hello. And I said, is this Dwight? And he said, yes. And I said, Dwight, um, I'm probably the last person on the entire planet you want to hear from. And he said, who? And I said, I'm the guy that sent you the uh, postcard. And I am so sorry, right? I come from a point of humility. And he screamed at me and called me all these different things. And I just kept on apologizing. And that went on for about four minutes. And then I asked him, I said, gosh, I have a very reputable company. And I thought you were somebody that uh, might be interested and I don't know you and you don't know me. How would you have recommended that I introduce myself to you? Should I have actually waited for you to pick up the paper outside? Should I maybe run my, you know, waited, uh, met you at the supermarket and run my, my basket into you? Like, what would you recommend? He, he laughed. And I ended up buying two properties and made $241,000. And he apologized to me, he, you know, but you call in and those angry callers are some of the best ones, but you call mm -hmm. in with a little bit of humility, apologize, ask them, hey, was there any anything offensive? Is there, th you know, I use a marketing company, is there anything that I can improve? And they're absolute gold mines. Now, the trick is over time, none of us should be actually doing this phone work. You really should have somebody doing it for you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a low cost person. Um, we actually have a team of people that do that for all of us because it's a lot of phone work. It's a lot right. of phone work. On average, you have to call somebody, you know, to get somebody back on the phone, it's an average of eight dials. Just imagine having to dial eight times, you know, multiple days to get somebody on the phone. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a conversion from those people into an appointment is about one in six. So you, that's 70 phone calls, 70 times dialing the phone to get an appointment. And, and most people are not willing to do sit there and dial 70 times. Mm. It's the most profitable part of our business. <laughs> Somebody has to do it though. So, you know, like what did they go through? You know, let's say they do get a person on the line. Is there a kind of a vetting process to see if they're an actual good fit for the potential investor? Yeah. 
we um, and I would be happy to give this to you for the show notes. We um, we have what we call our sales ninja script. And mm -hmm. what happened was I brought probably some. I, I brought about fifteen of our top clients uh, about four years ago. These are guys like uh, Clay Manship, who's got a multi-million dollar wholesale. Yeah, we know business. Clay. Yeah. Yeah. So Clay came in, Steve Carlson, and we and these are guys that are experts at sales. And I said, guys, let's build the absolute perfect words to the seller. Uh, the right words with the icebreaker. It's about a six minute interview. So exactly that we could train anybody. Mm -hmm. And so I, and then, and then I actually built a sales ninja team. It's a team. Uh, we have about 40 people that they do this all day long. We record all the calls um, in the States that we can, re can record, but it's a script that's about six minutes. It starts with, gosh, you know, let's say somebody called on a hang up. The, the words are, hey, uh, we missed a call from you. Were you calling about a property, a uh, note that you received in the mail or pop, pop, possibly a, a property that you're considering to sell? And, and there's four answers. Yes, no, maybe, or possible referral. Um, we'll say, hey, do you actually have maybe a couple of minutes where I could ask you a few questions about the property? And then I could pass you over to one of our buying specialists who could make you an offer and provide more details about who we are and more about our company. So it's the perfect words all the way down. You know, one of the questions that we ask is, is the property listed with the realtor? It's mm -hmm. one that's missed. A lot of people will go out and see a first, you know, a, 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 a retail sign in the front yard. Um, and so we'll ask that to bedrooms and bathrooms and is the property current currently occupied so it's it's really warming up the seller to find out if there's any motivation to sell and then mm -hmm. we'll work to schedule that as an appointment um and and so that's that's a team that's a that's a team that i built uh it was the biggest hole by the way for direct mail that i saw years ago and finally i just said you know what i'm going to see if i can actually build a world-class phone team mm -hmm. um yeah now i'll tell you another thing one on the on building a phone team because really if you're going to do direct mail or any of this you do somebody has to be dialing the sellers they have the money is going to be in the follow-up and and most people they don't realize it and that's why they fail and so um i never thought i could build the team overseas i always thought i needed people here stateside but it's expensive mm -hmm. and i i totally prove myself wrong so that we've actually turned we have the team in the philippines um it is a strategic weapon for all of us and i'm going to tell everybody uh, right now something if you've got somebody overseas you want to do this on your own this is this has worked really well for us so the seller is on the phone and often they will say where are you calling from and we want them to actually ask that question and they'll say where you're calling from. And so the, our team is trained. And what they say is I'm actually calling from the Philippines, um, Gary Boomershine or Jack or, you know, insert your name as our client, uh, hired me in the Philippines so he can pay higher prices for houses. Mm. And how, how am I doing? Is, this, is there any feedback that I could give to Mr. Boomershine on how I'm doing? The sellers love it. They love the answer. That's what's called an objection handler. Right? the seller camp with an objection. And now we're finding that our stick rate is almost a hundred percent. So people, the sellers are staying on the phone by asking that we almost want to, uh, we haven't done this yet, but we almost want to let them know that we're calling from the Philippines. Uh, but we haven't done that <laughs> just hmm. to test it out. No, that's so, a, that's, that's a great line. And that's, uh, yeah. That, and, and, you know, I, I, one other thing that you have your uh, people ask that I found pays off almost every time is, you know, have you considered listing it with a realtor? As if I've just run into a lot of other investors who, who almost keep that under a cloak or something as if that's a secret, like, right. but, but more times than not, you'll get far more information by simply asking that question. Yeah. Regarding their motivation. Yeah. I, we have this conversation, Jack, and, and this is, I mean, 
I'm in, what am I in, 10 masterminds, some of the top masterminds in the country with really, really st solid people that are doing massive direct mail. Scott Oots, I think Scott Oots does uh, on average 55, what did he say, 55,000 pieces of direct mail a week. So we're talking high volume guys. And I'll tell you a couple things. One is that there's no money to be made in this business if you're not talking to sellers. And the biggest fear that new, new investors have, probably some of the people that might be following and listening to us right now, the biggest fear is the fear of rejection, of getting on the phone and getting yelled at by a seller. And, 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 and so they'll go back to trying to find you know, the new little rainbow unicorn mailing list or the next marketing thing, the, the shiny object syndrome, right? The reality is you just have to talk to the seller and the re it, it has to be done. You can use all the systems and all these things that, that, that get you in front of the seller, but you still have to talk to the seller. And the reality is it's just a human conversation. Once you start having some at bats interacting with the seller, it is people buy and people sell to people that they like, trust and respect and being honest. And, uh, you know, I was coaching uh, Tyler in Dallas and a super, super amazing guy. And, you know, he, he, he was nervous originally talking to sellers. So I just said, just tell him who you are. You know, the fact he's, he, he actually was a pilot when he was like 14 years old. He had a pilot's license before mm -hmm. he actually was driving a car. And I said, tell, tell the sellers that. Tell them who you are. You know, when I come in, I actually show, show picture. Here's my wife and my kids. And uh, we've been doing this full time. We took our little nest egg uh, together, our, our little family in, investment, and we buy properties a few this month. And, you know, if there's an opportunity for, uh, you know, if this is a good situation for you and we can make a modest profit, I'd love to be an opportunity for you. Uh, but, and I love the, you know, I'll, I'll say, have you thought about listing it with, a, with an agent? Here's the thing. There's so many benefits to what we offer as investors. I know you know that, Jack, but for mm. everybody else, there's so many things. A lot of people don't want the hassle of waiting and mm. having people holding open houses and having people trample through their stuff or having to do the repairs. And so, um, you know, I buy, I buy properties with bad tenants. I know you probably do too. Mm -hmm. I love buying. I love, I love buying problems. I had uh, three sisters, older sisters who had an estranged son who had been living in this property uh, uh, in Oakland, California for eight years, rent free, no electricity. They turned the electricity off. He was still living. They couldn't get him out. And I, I said to the three sisters, how would you like it if I bought the property and I'll take, I'll take him as a renter. <laughs> he doesn't even have to pay rent. I'll take care of him. And, um, and they were so happy. They were in their late seventies and they said they, uh, they were super, super happy. Um, and so we, we buy, you know, as long as we can find the problem, right. Of the, what the seller's problem and we mm -hmm. can come up with a solution. It's, you know, we, we exchange, you know, a discount on our property for problems all, all the time. Right. Yeah. No, it's funny that we, I almost have that exact same story. We had, we had a family who just had, they couldn't, they didn't have it in their heart to evict them. So they sold us the property and then we went through the eviction process instead. Yeah. We ended up being the bad guy for, it, you know, so yeah. they didn't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, there's, that's not always, that's definitely not the norm. And, you know, if you're a real estate investor, let's say you're you know, somebody that's actually listening to this right now, um, you know, you can buy a property on the MLS that's listed with a realtor, if you're looking, that's a lot of people do that. Um, they call that online. We're looking for online properties. I love going after off market. That's, I, I, I mean, that's on market deals, right? Typically MLS foreclosure auctions or buying it at the HUD. It's super competitive. Mm -hmm. I like going off market. And right. the challenge with off market is that you have to do the, you have to do the marketing that generates the lead. The follow-up is the key and having a phone team. Somebody needs to do the phone work. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I always tell people, hey, it, it really, 
the work has to get done. It just doesn't have to get done by you. And um, you, you want to look at the marketing and that work and the cost of that as return on investment. You know, you're putting a dollar in and you're getting four or five, ten dollars out. And so a lot of novices, they look at it as an expense and they're like, oh, I'm going to do it myself. And that's a recipe for disaster. Mm. So it's, it's, you know, I would say if, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, in this business as a real estate investor, uh, it's going to do multiple transactions a year or a month. You want to think of it as a business and every business needs a CEO. That's what we are, right? A CEO and probably the money making activities, the thousand to $10,000 an hour work is talking and closing sellers. And if you're doing $10 an hour work as a CEO, you're going to have a $10 bank account. Mm -hmm. it's, so you want to, the marketing, the follow-up should be automated, done by somebody else. The phone dialing should be done by somebody else. Those are, those are $10 an hour or less activities and it shouldn't be us. Right. And I'm I sure you've that. done a, you, I'm sure you've done a comparison too, you, cause you know, there are some, there's a lot of CRMs out there now that uh, do the stealth voicemail, for example. So uh, yep. let's say, you know, um, in fact, my CRM does that where it, uh, somebody calls in and if I don't call them back myself, the CRM kind of sends them a stealth voicemail. So at least yep. they're getting some sort of follow-up. Yeah. But I, I just, I, I just know that's not as effective. Yeah, that it's interesting. So realestateinvestor.com, we recently actually merged and acquired two software companies um, specifically because we were using a system called Podio. A lot of mm -hmm. us, a lot of people, pretty popular. Uh, I call it Polio because <laughs> it has all kinds of problems. Yes, it's a very inexpensive solution, but in reality, what, what it there, and I won't go into it, no, I, I experienced it. It's a big time suck. That's <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> let me give you an example. We have realestateinvestor.com. We have uh, two, two, two CRMs. We have a light version. We call it touch. So you can go out to realestateinvestor.com. This is just one version. There's other CRMs and, and uh, but I'll tell everybody what, what was really important, but touch is, you know, it's less than a hundred bucks a month and it, it automates all the follow-up. The, the, the second version of it is called Grow, and that's a couple hundred dollars a month. And that does all the management and follow-up and it contract generation. So it can automatically send an electronic agreement for signature to the seller, all filled out, um, post properties, um, you know, for buyers. So if you got a, a deal under contract and you want to post it to your buyer's list with its own website. So that's our Grow version. And then Managed, is, uh, is kind of the premium service. And that's where our team will actually manage all the direct mail for our members consistently um, and a phone team and all the follow-up. So it's like, mm. you're, it's really the staff because you could have the systems, but somebody still has to run the systems, mm -hmm. right? It could be you or you could hire somebody. And a lot of people say, we just, we want, we just want you guys as experts. But here's the deal with follow-up, Jack. It needs to have... Just sending one follow-up voicemail is not enough, not today in this market. So a lead comes in, um, number one, uh, it needs to actually go out multiple channels. So text, ringless voicemail, email, follow-up letter, and over to the, an auto dialer to be called. And that needs to be what we call no seller left behind, which means that drip and sequences needs to go on for years mm -hmm. because the reality is 90% come after that six interaction. And so you need multiple channels. Um, a, a lead comes in, I'll give everybody, I, I don't want to get way down statistics because I know that I can do that as the nutty professor, but <clears throat> a proven fact is that if you don't interact with the seller within 15 minutes of that lead coming in, your chances of conversion of that lead into a deal goes down by 400%. So you have to interact with the seller within 15 minutes. So we, we actually, a lead will come in, we will text message them, 
with the and the words need to be they cannot look like it was uh it can't look like it was a machine it has to look personal it has to be customized it it has to be delayed so if a if a if a, a message comes in and within three seconds a text message goes out the seller knows that that was automatic they know that that was system generated they won't respond to it so we have to have a delay in it most of the crms out there they don't they haven't built it to have a delay Mm -hmm. Why? Because they were built by technical people, they not real estate people. Um, it needs to go to a phone team with the right script so that, it, so that they get back on the phone. And, and then the type of lead that comes in, the type of lead um, of where it came in from needs to have a different sequence. So if a seller comes in and says they're not interested, you're not going to want to text them immediately, right? You're going to want it to be delayed for three to four months. And then slowly the follow-up starts. If mm -hmm. somebody comes in and it was a hang up, you want to be quick, but you want the message to be very specific to a hang up. Hey, we missed a call from you. What was the, what was the address of the property you wanted to sell? And then it needs to have, you know, your name or, or, or somebody's name and a local phone number on there. Um, typically it also needs to be from the same, the phone number needs to be the same number that they called in off of. Most CRMs don't do that. Um, so mm -hmm. that's why we, that's why we built our own. Um, a lot of CRMs you have to have, you also have to, you know, you have to have your own call system like call rail or freedom voice. And you got to set up all these different sly broadcasts. And we, we wanted it all in one package. Right. Um, and then, and then the other thing, these CRMs, you, you have, they'll support the follow-up, but you have to write all the scripts. And so I've yet to find anybody that uses another CRM that has written a script. <laughs> Why? Mm -hmm. Because it, you know, most of us are real estate guys. We're not technical guys. Right. And so what, what we did is we actually, in our system for realestateinvestor.com, we actually wrote all the scripts. We came together and said, what are the perfect words and what's the order? What's the sequence? You know, is, does it need to go out every day? Does it need to go out every three days? What's the best time of the day to actually interact and, and send the uh, send them the, the response back? And that's mm. all pre-built. So, boy, I could just go on and on and on here. So, um, so with with what you were just saying there, when you when they're doing a marketing list, do you basically skip trace everybody that whole list? basically loaded into your CRM. So you have that, that contact information preloaded, if you will, so that when they do call in, you already know who they are and you can have that personalization. Yeah. yeah. It's a really great question. The answer is no. So if you're sending out direct mail, it is not cost. Uh, it's cost prohibitive to try to actually skip trace the phone number. Why to skip trace the phone number correctly to uh, is, is not a half a penny. It's usually to get the right data. Like we actually, we have skip tracing available in our service. It is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's about the most cost effective that you can get. We've negotiated a monster deal. It's, it's from a company where IDI uh, sure. actually yeah. goes to, and I know you're familiar with them. Um, so yeah, you do not need to do that. Plus, you know, if you're sending out a thousand postcards, you're only going to get a response off of a, uh, off of a certain percentage. So to buy the whole phone list for just for the, for the, for the small percentage, the two, the, the one to two to 3% that are going to come back off of mm -hmm. the direct mail, um, is not cost. It's not, it's not effective. Now, if you're going to, if you're going to do it right and you buy the mailing list and then you data stack it to get the vacants, the vacants that you'll want to pull and those would be good for text messaging, right? So you mm -hmm. direct mail, you can do a larger group and then you might take a percentage of that and sk skip trace those for doing text message broadcasting and ringless voicemail or cold calling. So the list can actually be reused, but actually, you know, it, it really depends on what the purpose is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, no. Now I'll, I'll give you another little, uh, thing that has been incredibly effective off of all the direct mail, the return postcards that we get, um, about four to five percent is the national average of of postcards that will come back in the mail mm -hmm. returned. 
And what we have found is there's a percentage of the ones that are returned that will say vacant. They'll say uh, deceased, undeliverable. Those are absolute gold mine to skip trace. So you send out a thousand postcards, you get 40 or 50 back. Of the 40 to 50 that you get back from the thousand mailed, you're probably gonna have 15 that those should be skip traced and given to somebody to be called. Those are gold. Mm. That's, That's uh, the reason that, and the reason they're gold is the competitors are not doing this. Right. The harder, it, the harder it is to, to locate a seller and no, and you have less, you have less competition, the, 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 the better the results. Sure. So do you have, you know, now I'm going to show some interest in your, in your CRM here now. Um, do you have a way for you know, if somebody was entrenched in Podio or something else right now, is there an easy way to migrate to a, to your solution? Yeah, we built, um, we actually have a migration path where our team as part of the process will migrate people from Podio over to our system. We do that. Uh, in fact, we had all of our former clients, we built Podio. Um, we were the largest client, by the way. The, our company was the largest client of Podio. Um, uh, in fact, when there were performance problems that you probably experienced, they were coming from us. We pretty much <laughs> broke the system. And that's one of the reasons why we decided to move away from Podio. Um, <clears throat> but yes, there's a migration path of how we can take the leads and the deals and all that data and migrate it over into uh, our system. There, there were other things with Podio. Um, you know, just the, the user experience is terrible, right? It's just like one mm -hmm. long list. It's very hard to, to, to train a staff uh, to use it. So as there were other limitations. So when you log into our system, <clears throat> we have all the list data loaded in ours as well. So when a lead comes in, right, from a postcard or maybe a carrot website, or maybe uh, whatever the marketing is, a lead comes in, the very first thing we do is we will match up and find, hey, do we know the list that it came from? That's absolutely gold. So mm. most of the Podio systems and other CRMs do not do that. The second thing that we do is we socially profile uh, to see if there's a Facebook, uh, if, that, if that person has an email address, a Facebook, a LinkedIn, a Twitter, and we're able to pull that data automatically, instantaneously back because that gives us the capability of interacting and possibly, you know, reaching out to them in, with other channels. And then the follow-up automatically kicks off, depending upon the type of lead, the follow-up sequence. Uh, and then if they're using our phone team, our Sales Ninja phone team, then they'll be called as well forever to turn it into a qualified appointment. So, so following them up on those social media links, have you gotten or seen any pushback from, from people? I mean, there's been some issues, you know, regarding people being concerned with their privacy and, and this and that. Like, have, have you found anybody being but creeped yeah, out by <laughs> being reached out to them? through? No, uh, well, where we've seen the issues is when you're actually broadcasting. There are, sure. you know, like if you're broadcasting to a cold list, that's typically where the issues are. If somebody comes in as an inbound lead, we haven't seen that. In fact, um, an in incredible thing, and I'd recommend this to anybody that's buying properties right now and you're already doing this, is every deal that you close with a seller, get a short testimonial, a quick two to three minute video or shorter, right off of your cell phone with the seller. And, and we're having our clients put those met those video links right back into the follow up. So as the lead comes in, it's something to put back out to the seller. Hey, we just closed. Uh, 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 thought this might be relevant. You know, we just closed another property. And if you know somebody, if you're thinking of selling or you know somebody would love to we'd love to talk to uh, you or a, a referral. And then you put the link of the video testimonial. Um, we're not, we don't have a lot of people. I know the people that are doing this are having great success, uh, but retargeting. So being able to do Facebook retargeting ads, somebody comes in as an existing lead with an email and being able to retarget them on Facebook uh, in some other places has been super fruitful. Hmm. So, well, yeah, I, 
I warned you that uh, this was, I was hoping, you know, try to keep it to 20, 30 minutes, but look, we're, we're closing in on an hour already. Um, so if, if people didn't pull out a lot of great nuggets and information out of this episode, I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, between your three Ps, you, you gave us protect, pivot, and, it, and what was the third one? And profit. Profit. It's per yeah, and especially in this market right now. That's uh, we actually created a pr uh, public Facebook group called. It's on Facebook called Real Estate Investor Beacon. It was just our give as a company back to the, our community uh, in the real estate niche of what's working and what are we all doing right now in this market. Where I've been interviewing uh, people, uh, big hitters of what people are doing right now. How are they adjusting? And that's a very consistent message for us, which is protect, right? A lot of us are tightening up. We're getting a lot sharper in terms of our marketing spend right now. Um, this, is not, this is not a time to sit idle, you know, watching the TV. Uh, this is most of us are doubling up on marketing. A lot of us are taking the existing leads and going back to them. So sellers that were not motivated, we're seeing a lot of them that are motivated right now. So the old leads that maybe the seller said are not interested are turning into being great deals right now. Um, but it's protect and then it's pivot going into the new market and then profit. And sure. uh, so a lot of us are doing that. A lot of us are gearing up for opportunities to buy creatively. So that's uh, historically we've been buying with all cash. So a lot of us are going into, there'll be incredible opportunities buying creatively, which I won't go into a lot of detail and also raising money uh, because there's going to be deal opportunities coming our way within the foreseeable future. Sure. No money without talking to the sellers. And I'll, in fact, you mentioned when uh, uh, people sometimes are afraid to make those phone calls. Um, I, I don't know, for, for some reason, it, it always helps me to remember that you can't say the wrong thing to the right person. I mean, it's just... So make sure you're making, doing that follow-up is key. And this is really an interesting statistic you threw out that 90% of your leads are going to come from your like sixth or more follow-up. Yeah. Um, Gosh, every, you know, Jack, especially for everybody, this is the key. It is time tested. This is not just something new and it's not just real estate. This is a proven fact on doing direct response marketing, which is direct mail or any of these sources. So 3%, 3% of the profits come from the initial call. So if people are wondering why they're not, imagine 97, you take whatever you've made, that's only 3% of the potential off of your existing lead pool. The money is all in the follow-up and, and, and including the phone follow-up. It is extremely profitable, 90% of the deals and the profits come after the six interaction and less than 10% of anybody in this business actually follow up more than twice. So all the profit is after number six follow up. Um, and, and, and the other piece is repetitive marketing and has to be consistent. So people, if they're going to do it, don't just do it for a week or two or a month. You want to be committed to it. Marketing is a process. Um, I'll tell you a couple other things. Just, it's time tested on average, on average off of direct mail. And by the way, all these lead sources, direct mail, text messaging, any direct response, it's an average of 45 leads produce a deal. All right. Some lists will be as low as 20, but on mm -hmm. average over the long haul, 45 leads produce a deal. 45 will be about 15, one third of the 45, 15 will be what we call good leads. The rest of them are not ready. Uh, about half of those we will t typically make offers to to close one. And that's a national average. So people will get 10 leads and they'll say, why didn't I make any money? This, this direct mail doesn't work in my market. It's too competitive. No, it's actually, it's a numbers game. And then we're, we're continuously working all of the old leads forever. Uh, <clears throat> It because costs. your key there was that you just said they weren't ready. They weren't ready. You just right? got to hit them when they're right. <laughs> That's right. 
the mindset of anybody doing this should be that all leads suck until you talk to the seller, Mm -hmm. right? They don't just come in motivated. What we're looking for is a reasonable seller and they get more and more motivated. Not all sellers are ready yet. And so you have to interact with them. And um, it's, it's, it's the psychology, just thinking just like a buying a car, people that will go to the dealership. A week or two weeks so it's a process and a lot of people are they, they they're looking for the fairy tale motivated seller it doesn't exist there's no mm-hmm. perfect list there's no perfect letter there's no perfect website it's a process and right. the people the people that are doing it right are making tons of money off of it Scott Scott Oots had one of his best months uh, you know he's and he's doubling up we just did inter- he, he's actually uh, real estate investor beacon. He, we just interviewed him. Uh, sure. he, so that was, that would be a good one for people to listen to. He's a, you know, he's a high seven figure guy in one of the most competitive markets in the country. So, well, and then you, you threw out one last a staggering statistic that you need to contact or, or reach back out to these people within 15 minutes or their interest drops 400%. That is if that doesn't get you back on the phones, I don't know what does. Yeah. So, yeah. So, at the very, at, yeah. Yeah. Then what were you going to say at the very least what? Oh, at the very least, it's the text message, a text message or, you know, it, it also typically four to 5 PM, four to 5 PM is the best time Wednesdays and Thursdays to call back uh, is what we have found. Mm-hmm. The problem is most of us are busy right? Mm-hmm. So that's another reason why you want to have a system to automate the follow-up and you want a phone team that's built in to do it for us. So, well, I'm going to end with one last question. Was there a question you wish, wished I would have asked you here tonight? Is this a good time to be in the real estate investor niche would be probably the number one question. And this is the type of market that we're going into right now that real estate investors dream of. And so um, I, this is an incredible, incredible market that we're about ready to go into. Um, I, I, you know, with, with, with a situation like this, you know, we want to buy low and sell high. The, the market, the, the money, the primary amount of money was made at the beginning of the cycle, 2008, to 2012, right? Then we get into the back end, which is a euphoric stage where everybody's talking real estate. So Mm. we're now going back into the reset of the market. And I would say people that are sitting on the sidelines, it's, it's, uh, we're going to see a lot of people exit. And this is the time to prepare and do the three P's and be ready to pivot and profit. Well, I can't thank you enough, Gary, for being on the show. This was I, and, and I really appreciate you uh, sticking it out and giving us so much time. If uh, people were interested in following up with you or finding your podcast, I know you, I don't think you could have an easier domain name to remember the <laughs> real estate investor.com. I mean, man, what a, what a great domain name. Um, where else would they find you? Yeah. You know, Facebook, real estate, and you can type in Facebook groups, real estate investor beacon. Uh, that's something we set up specifically as our give back. That's got great content. Uh, we have a huddle. Uh, we have a podcast that's real estate investor huddle and uh, got some great interviews there. And then of course you can always check us out. Our team loves to talk. Uh, you won't find a, a salesy approach. It's very much, I've got an organization with about 110 people working for us and, you know, we love helping other investors, other like-minded investors. And if we can help, uh, we've got a lot of articles, ton of articles of, uh, and, and inform- you know, helpful tips. If you're trying to do stuff on your own, we've got a lot of free resources out there. So take advantage of all that. And, um, and if we can ever help you out, let us know. Well, I, I, again, really appreciate your time. It was great chatting with you and I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah. Awesome, Jack and everybody. Have a great one.